Now we're going to discuss interference of waves. Uh, the question is if two or more waves are traveling in the same medium and they meet to give a resultant wave, uh, how can we express the wave function of the resultant wave? The answer is given by uh, the superposition principle. The superposition uh, principle states that if we have a linear medium, if the waves are linear waves, the resultant wave function is the algebraic sum of the individual wave functions. So we just have to uh, add them up in order to get the resultant wave function. Now this principle will apply, as I said, if the waves are linear. So we have to distinguish between linear waves and nonlinear waves. Uh, in a linear medium, when we have a linear wave, uh, the wavelength uh, is going to be much larger than the amplitude. So these are relatively small amplitude waves. And in this case, the superposition principle applies. If we have a nonlinear wave, uh, for nonlinear waves, these are large amplitude uh, waves where the superposition principle uh, doesn't apply. No superposition uh, principle for these ones. So let's say that I have a linear medium and these uh, waves, traveling waves, come together and they uh, reach the same point. For example, I have pulses uh, overlapping. If I use the superposition principle here, uh, when the pulses come together, they add up and the, the amplitude is going to be the sum of the individual amplitudes. And when, the, when they are no longer overlapping, uh, it appears that they have not even uh, interacted with each other. So they continue on their paths uh, as if nothing has happened. So in this case, uh, when I have the individual pulses adding up to give me the resultant wave function, uh, the interference that I observe, that's the combination of the separate waves to produce this resultant wave, is uh, called constructive interference. Constructive interference. And in another scenario where I have the, the algebraic sum of the two pulses, if they are out of phase, uh, the, the resultant wave function will have an amplitude that is the difference between the individual amplitudes. Uh, or if they have the same amplitude, then they would completely cancel and I would see uh, nothing uh, on the string for a moment and then they continue on their paths as if nothing has happened. In this case, I have a destructive interference. So, uh, when the displacements caused by these uh, waves or pulses are in the same direction, uh, they add up to produce a larger amplitude that gives me constructive interference, displacements in the same direction. And when the displacements are in the opposite directions, I have destructive interference. By displacements, what do we mean? Uh, displacements of the uh, elements of the string here. So you can see that these displacements uh, are in the same direction. And here, when I have destructive interference, these displacements 
are in opposite directions. So I have destructive interference. So what I call interference is basically the combination of separate waves to produce a resultant wave. The combination of separate waves to produce a resultant wave is called interference. As we have seen, we have two types, displacements in the same direction, constructive interference, displacements in the opposite direction, we have destructive interference. Now let's take a look at superposition of uh, sinusoidal waves. So I consider uh, two sinusoidal waves uh, traveling in the same direction in a linear medium. The first wave function is a sine kx minus omega t. So it's a, a sinusoidal wave traveling to the right. And the second one is also a sine kx minus omega t but has a phase difference phi uh, with respect to the other one so when these two uh, separate waves uh, come to interfere by using superposition principle i have to algebraically add them up in order to find the resultant wave function so it will be a uh, sine kx minus omega t plus sine kx minus omega t plus phi. Uh, the question is how do I add up uh, sine a and sine b? Uh, so this trigonometric identity uh, which we can show easily is 2 sine a plus b over 2 uh, cosine a minus b over 2. So let's stop for a moment uh, and uh, show that that's the case uh, so I have uh, sine of a over 2 plus b over 2 that is sine a over 2 cosine b over 2 plus uh, cosine a over 2 sine b over 2 then cosine a minus b over 2 a over 2 minus b over 2 that is cosine a over 2 cosine b over 2 plus sine a over 2 sine b over 2 so if I multiply these two I will get um, sine a over 2 cosine a over 2 so from the first one here uh, cosine square b over 2 uh, now I will encounter sine a over 2 cosine a over 2 also in this second one here so this is the first term the second term is this one uh, I have sine a over 2 cosine a over 2 sine square b over 2 then the third term is the one of the cross terms so this is uh, the third term uh, sine b over 2 uh, cosine b over 2 sine square a over 2 and now comes the fourth term um, sine b over 2 cosine b over 2 uh, cosine square a over 2 and these two are added together and I obtain uh, sine a over 2 cosine a over 2 parentheses cosine square b over 2 sine square b over 2 that's 1 and then sine b over 2 cosine b over 2 parentheses I have sine square a over 2 
cosine square a over 2, that's 1. And this is equal to uh, sine a over 2. So it's 2 sine a over 2 cosine a over 2 is sine a. So it's divided by 2. And this is sine b divided by 2. Therefore, I see that sine a plus sine b is 2 uh, sine a plus b over 2 cosine a minus b over 2. So we have verified this uh, briefly here. So using this uh, trigonometric identity, I find that my resultant wave function is going to be equal to 2a sine a plus b over 2. So it's going to be sine kx minus omega t plus phi over 2 cosine a minus b over 2. So it will be cosine phi over 2. Or if I, if I rewrite it this way, 2a cosine phi over 2 sine kx minus omega t plus phi over 2. The resultant wave function that I obtain here uh, has the amplitude 2a cosine phi over 2 and the amplitude depends on the phase difference between the two. Uh, it has the same k, same omega, but amplitude is different. It is 2a cosine phi over 2. So this is a traveling wave that's traveling to the right with a phase phi over 2. Okay, so under what condition do I get constructive interference? So for constructive uh, interference, I'm going to require uh, that these amplitudes add up. So I have uh, cosine phi over 2 is equal to plus or minus 1. And this will be satisfied when phi is equal to 0, when phi is equal to 2 pi, 4 pi, etc. So phi is equal to uh, 2n pi, n is an integer. So even multiples of pi. For destructive interference, uh, I will require that they cancel each other. So therefore, cosine phi over 2 should be equal to 0. That means phi is equal to pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, etc. Phi is equal to 2n plus 1 pi, where n is an integer. So it's odd multiples of pi. So even multiples of pi gives me constructive interference. Odd multiples of pi gives me destructive interference. So as we have seen, if the waves have different amplitudes, then the destructive interference would give me an amplitude that is the difference between the amplitudes of the waves. But here I have the same amplitude for y1 and y2. Therefore, the destructive interference should give me zero amplitude for the resultant wave. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at an example uh, for interference of sound waves. Two identical loudspeakers placed three meters apart are driven by the same oscillator. A listener is originally at point O, located 8 meters from the center of the line connecting the two speakers. The listener then moves to a point P, which is a perpendicular distance 0.35 meters from O, and she experiences the first minimum in sound intensity, what is the frequency of the oscillator. So. Uh, these are two identical loudspeakers. So when I look at the waves uh, created by these speakers, they start out in phase. So I'm going to have a wave traveling from uh, this loudspeaker 
uh, to the listener like this uh, so I'm going to see so many wavelengths uh, traveling to this speaker and then I see the other speaker also producing waves initially in phase with the other one now when these two waves uh, meet at this point uh, uh, P they're going to have the first uh, destructive interference so let me think about what that means so when I have a, a wave traveling one wavelength and two wavelengths like this and then an identical wave uh, identical source has created another wave but in order to reach the same point here this one has traveled um, just one wavelength so I have put uh, this is source one this is source 2 producing these waves obviously when they meet at this point they're going to have constructive interference so uh, why is there a constructive interference because there is no uh, phase difference uh, in between the two waves uh, actually there is a path difference this one has traveled an extra distance delta r is lambda so this one uh, the total distance traveled by uh, the waves produced by s1 r1 is equal to 2 lambda for s2 the the distance traveled is lambda so the path difference delta r is equal to lambda i get constructive interference so when we look at the phase difference between two two waves if the phase difference between the two waves is exactly equal to 2 pi that means the path difference delta x uh, between the two waves is exactly equal to lambda so that's one complete cycle is 2 pi uh, and one complete cycle in the uh, in the path traveled is lambda so we have this important relationship between uh, phase difference and path difference uh, path difference of one lambda produces a phase difference of two pi so when i look at this problem i see that uh, the waves produced by uh, this source s1 and this source s2 are traveling uh, different distances so when they reach s1 and s2 identical uh, so when they go to point O, at point O, the distance traveled by the first source, R1, will be, uh, so let's take a look at it, it will be this distance, so this will, it will travel this distance, and from s2 i would have exactly the same distance traveled so i would see that r1 and r2 for the waves traveling to point o would be the same and they would be equal to uh, from this triangle uh, here um, square root of 8 square plus 1.5 square so these two would be the same 1.5 and 1.5 uh, so the path difference between the two would be zero the phase difference would be zero and i would have constructive interference uh, a maximum in at point o but when they travel different distances uh, as seen in the second scenario now i have uh, R1 changing to a smaller uh, distance so this is my new R1 and uh, this is my new R2 
so if I calculate the distance traveled by the first wave, R1, is square root of, uh, I can find that distance by looking at this triangle, square root of um, 8 square plus 1.15 square, that distance traveled is 8.08 .08 meters, and R2, the distance traveled by uh, the waves coming from the second one would be calculated using this triangle and that would be square root of uh, 1.85 square plus 8 square which is 8.21 meters. So these two waves are not traveling the same distance. R2 minus R1 is equal to 0.13 meters. And that corresponds to the first minimum. Now, when do I observe the first minimum? Uh, the first minimum corresponds to a path difference of uh, lambda over 2. So path difference is equal to 0 path difference is equal to lambda, 2 lambda, 3 lambda, this will be maxima, and the path difference is equal to lambda over 2, 3 lambda over 2, 5 lambda over 2, that will be minima. So the first one occurs at lambda over 2, so therefore this should be 0.13 meters. I find that the wavelength is 0.26 meters. Since these are sound waves, the speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second. That is lambda times the frequency. So the frequency of the, uh, the waves produced by these speakers would, would be 343 divided by 0 0.26, 1.32 uh, kilohertz. Alright, so I can calculate the frequency of the uh, waves produced by these sources to be 1.32 kilohertz by looking at uh, the path differences uh, in the, the differences in the total uh, distance traveled by these waves when they reach uh, point P.